This conference will now be recorded. Amazing. Okay, so I think that's all the housekeeping items. Catherine, over to you. Hi, I'm Catherine Latimer, and I'm the Executive Director of the John Howard Society of Canada. And I know that I have met some of you, but not all of you. And I really value the opportunity uh, to get feedback from the John Howard community. I think it's a great way to end our last formal session of the John Howard Society week. And as many of you know, um, John Howard Society of Canada, like, like all of the John Howard Societies, is fully committed to just, effective and humane responses to the causes and consequences of crime. And that often leads us into being fairly um, critical of some of the things that are happening in federal corrections, uh, and perhaps more so now that after this bleak COVID period, which has really made things very difficult. But one of the things that we consider to be um, a possibly really advantageous and positive thing is Bill C-228, which is a private member's bill from a um, conservative backbencher from New Brunswick. And this bill uh, requires the Minister of Public Safety to come up with a national framework to reduce recidivism um, by the end of June. So time's getting a bit short and they're busy scrambling trying to figure out what should be included in this framework. And I, I really believe that those who work on the front lines of John Howard and have walked with those who are making that difficult journey from prison into communities uh, with a view to leading crime-free and constructive lives really have a lot to offer in terms of knowing uh, what the challenges were, uh, what worked well, and what additional things could be put in place that would make it easier for people to successfully uh, reintegrate after custody. So I'm really pleased uh, that we're going to be able to have a discussion about these items because I feel like I've got a lot to learn and that you all have a significant amount to contribute and it's a nice um, sized group which is great and maybe what I'll do is I'll just um, not everybody has a name there but most people are displaying with a name and if you could just indicate what um, John Howard Society your uh, your name and what John Howard Society you're representing or you're working with that would be great uh, you don't have to be representing your society. Uh, we're very interested in your your views as someone who's done this kind of work. So thank you very much. And why don't we start with um, Connor? I see Connor Mullen is there. Uh, <laughs> Colin, Connor is here, and he's our board representative from Prince Edward Island. Glad to, glad to have you there. What about you, Wanda? Do you want to just? I'll, I'll just. I don't know if the display is the same for everybody, but. Wanda, do you just want to uh, uh, to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Wanda Grant. Um, I work with the John Howard Society in Truro, uh, Central Region, and I'm Fabulous. a restor restorative justice caseworker in our office. Fabulous. Okay, Jody, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there, uh, my name is Jody Chibati and I'm from Brandon, Manitoba. I'm a board member with the Brandon John Howard Society. Great, welcome. Nice to have Brandon on board. Uh, Narda, there's a familiar name. I'm guessing Alberta. You're right. Um, Calgary John <laughs> Howard Society, Catherine, good to see you again. And I work... Uh, you, Narda. Thank you. Um, and I have someone who says, it just says waiting for names. So if your name's not displayed, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? Sorry, that was just me. I was just listening in there. My name is Ben Feist. I'm from uh, North Battleford, Saskatchewan, and I'm the uh, president of the John Howard Society of Saskatchewan for the board. Fabulous. Great. Welcome, Ben. Okay. Um, Jackie. Hi there. Good afternoon. I'm Jackie Martin. I'm from the John Howard Society in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and I'm the assistant executive director here. Great. Um, Lacey. Hi there, uh, I'm Lacey. I'm with the Calgary John Howard Society along with Narda. I'm the Director of Community Services and Quality Improvement. Here. Fabulous. Great. Um, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Derham. I'm 
uh, in Toronto, and I'm in the midst of uh, hopefully joining the board of the John Howard Society of Toronto and was made aware of this session, which I thought sounded really interesting. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Nice, nice to have you aboard, Richard. Uh, Chris. You. Uh, yes, hello and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Christina King and I'm one of the regional uh, directors for the John Howard Society of Nova Scotia. Great. And Maddie. Hi there. Um, my name is Maddie Van Veen. I work with Chris and Wanda at the John Howard Society in Truro, Nova Scotia. And I'm the admin assistant. Okay, that's great. Um, so we have good, uh, good representation from east and west and uh, uh, hopefully a variety of experiences that, that can be shared. And I must say, I'm very empathetic with what it is that you do. Oh, sorry, Ben. Our other Ben, our blog editor. Would yeah, you like to introduce um, yourself? Sure. I'm the uh, volunteer editor of the John Howard blog. I've just put something in chat with the link to the blog and uh, just inviting any of the John Howards across the country to make use of any of the material that's on the blog uh, and to contribute ideas about things that would be of interest for blog posts. So look forward to that. That's great. Thanks, man. Okay, I'm, you know, I normally don't do uh, any kind of frontline service, but um, I was helping a, or a prisoner was helping me uh, with our solitary confinement issues some years ago. And um, he was coming out at warrant expiry uh, with essentially no reintegration or release plan and nobody really supporting him. Uh, my good colleagues at John Howard Society of Ottawa uh, gave me some advice, uh, but I essentially met him at the gates of um, Millhaven Institution and um, was really surprised uh, by the lack of preparedness uh, for someone like him. I think when they're coming out on parole, it's a little bit better, but he had, you know, ID that wasn't really accepted anywhere. He had no place to live. He had limited resources. He had two weeks of medical um, medicines and basically facing a very bleak uphill struggle uh, to, to try and, and turn life around, which he was committed to do. Um, just because of the lack of preparation and the, uh, the absence of any kind of uh, supports for him. So I would like to get a sense from, from people of, of what they believe some of the major challenges are that people are facing as they're reintegrating back into the community. So uh, really welcome some uh, insights from those who've, uh, who've worked with, with prisoners who are coming back in. Okay, sure. I just, I'm just going gonna, gonna, to, Lacey, thank you. <laughs> I'm a little, uh, I've been kind of over on the community services side for, for the last year and a half and stuff, but I used to work in the CRX and did so for, for about 15 years. Um, so I would say that's not an, that's not an uncommon occurrence for somebody who, who hits warrant expiry date in the institution and gets released with nothing. And, and to me, it just, it's, it's always been baffling that that I mean, because I mean, if you're being released at warrant expiry, it means you're a high risk to reoffend. Yeah. Um, and yet we just we just let them go with no supports and expect them to do okay and not reoffend. So I think it's a bit ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly from our perspective, there's a lack of funding, right? There's there's nobody's nobody's paying us to try and do some of this stuff. We do have one one full-time worker who, who works in our community reentry uh, and support program. Um, but she's she's one individual who's helping people both in the provincial system as well as the federal system, it's, you know, and she'll do transition planning with them and, and whatnot. But but again, it's that's one individual serving serving the Calgary area and that's just not not enough. And, not and adequate, so, yeah. So what what is the process like for somebody who's not coming out at warrant expiry. So they're, you know, uh, they're coming out at parole, they may be going into one of our CRFs, or they may be somewhere else, being housed somewhere else in the community. Is there, you know, um, support, particular challenges that they're facing? Um, 
I mean, I certainly think that that the major challenges is always housing, uh, financial supports, medical supports is always a big thing, right? There's this this battle between the the federal system and the provincial healthcare system as to who's responsible to to do that. Um, we have seen some improvements in that in the in the last little while, in that our you know somebody who is on day parole is able to access some provincial um benefits for prescription coverage and whatnot um but it's still tough and they're also not coming out where we we as much as we preach and we try to say when they're inside get their taxes done get them up to date get them the proper id so that when they come out they have they have those things to, to be able to get you know low income bus passes and and bank account and and all of those basic needs but we don't see it it's very rare that they actually come out with those those sorts of things and stuff. So, so obviously, when you're coming to a CRF, or at least hopefully, when you're coming to a CRF, and certainly in our experiences, is, is those are the first things we try to tackle. Is those those basic things get to get those taxes done, get the get the basic ID and, and all of that sort of stuff. But the, uh, and and they have supports in that scenario. But if somebody's coming out on a stat release and they're being released into homelessness, then yes, then. Um, then what? And I, and I mean, we do offer supports in terms of getting ID and stuff like that through our in intake process. But, but again, we're only one. And and if these things happen beforehand, if like you know, you have a kind of a captive audience sitting there inside the institution. And and so, I mean, I would love to see, I would, I'd love to be able to go in and and do some of those things while they're inside, as opposed to waiting until they're outside, right? What, Just to what about that? that? I mean, what what is the capacity for inreach into the institutions? Um, I mean, for for us, it's it's not much. We do it, some inreach stuff at the. I mean, Calgary doesn't have any federal institutions, right? right? Our closest our closest one is is Bowden and Drumheller, and they're both an hour plus away. Uh, so we we do very little. If it's, I know that our halfway houses do some inreach, but again, that's specific to the the individuals who would be coming out to the halfway houses, right? That's what that's what they're focused on and stuff like that. So we don't have a lot of ability to do inreach into the federal institutions from here. Again, our our Crest program uh, does some over the phone and and things like that when they can. Um, but but again not able to do any real logistical work until people are actually released into the community. yeah yeah i think that's a i think that's a real problem in many ways eh? because certainly this this prisoner that i was working with huge distrust like he was not he and csc as you might imagine since he was being held for more expiry there was not a lot of trust there and he wasn't about to even try and reveal what city he was going to go to um so the support's certainly not going to be put into place. But he was willing to speak to the John Howard societies, right? I mean, there was an element of trust because it was sort of a non-government organization. Mm -hmm. He didn't expect everything that he told us to be captured in his file somewhere, you know? So it was, yeah. I think I think inReach is something that um, would be extremely helpful uh, in terms of, putting some kind of reasonable plan together for people. But I agree with you, Lacey. I think there's a real problem in terms of um, in terms of funding and our capacity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does anybody having any ability to be able to get into the into the federal or provincial prisons in terms of um, uh, preparation for reintegration? Or you kind of have to wait until they're, oh, is that Narda's hand up? Yes. Hi, um, Narda. Hi, uh, the program I'm working with right now is a reintegration program for youth and young adults. So I'm Great. able to go into the Calgary Young Offender Center um, and work with youth prior to their release, uh, preferably Great. two months or so prior to their release um, to try to just build relationship with them. And of course, during COVID, that's been very challenging. There's been times where they haven't had visitors come in. Um, but most of the time I'm able to either do phone, uh, um, scheduled phone calls or virtual meetings if youth are either at Edmonton Young Offender Centers, Calgary, or within the hospital um, open custody environment where they may be receiving treatment or something like that. Um, 
So it's been very helpful. I find that when I get a person uh, to work with me who is in a very short period of being released, and I have accepted quite a few that, that are that are going to be released within weeks, um, you're playing catch up when they're in community to try to connect with them and, and to build yeah. rapport. And of course, again, during COVID, that's, that's been even more complicated, being able to meet with clients. And, and a lot of my clients are, are very high risk clients. So they're also trying to find safety within those meetings it can be logistically challenging. Um, so I find it very valuable to work with people before they're released from custody. Absolutely. The, the relationships are, are much more meaningful. Um, like Lacey says, they're there. They're, they're happy to meet with you. Um, they get out of their cells for a while. Um, and so it's usually a, an enjoyable meeting. And you can do some assessments with them ahead of time, figure out what it is that they do need so you can start to prepare for their entry into community. So I, I take it then that you, you like the idea of, of planning for the individual's needs and risk factors then, eh? rather than some sort of standard set of conditions or programs that they need to take, eh? Oh, it's, I think it's critical that, that we're doing some pre-planning so that they don't feel like they're on their own as soon as they open the doors and they go home. They, some of them don't even have a, a decent ride home. So the least we can do is provide a, a taxi chit or, or something, an Uber or something for them to get home safely if we're not able to drive them ourselves, make sure they get to their destination. I mean, that's just a basic thing. But also yeah. just understanding the kind of time that's going to need to be involved with, with this specific client if they need all their ID, if they need to get their Indigenous status or something like that. That stuff takes a lot of time if they need to apply for Alberta Works. Um, those things are really great to be able to kind of get started if you can so that there's not so much lag time in between the time they're released and the time they actually receive some benefit. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the um, locations of some of the other John Howard members. Uh, so there wouldn't be a federal institution in the Sioux or Branford. I don't know about Truro. Um, is there one in Truro? Is there one close to Truro? Uh, we do have a women's uh, federal institution in Truro. Okay, and is is uh, John Howard active there, or is it mostly the? Um, up, yeah, up until COVID, that that kind of puts yeah. some yeah. Uh, barriers. Uh, but we were going up uh, to visit the the women at the institution, building relationships and having restorative Great. conversations. Um, our sister agency, Elizabeth Fry, who's also has a uh, outreach office here in Truro. Uh, we're quite actively involved um, going up and assisting the women, but uh, it's it's something that I want to get back into, uh, you know, doing and being more active and just hoping that you know, we can get back in with some of the, the restrictions being lifted. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, one of the things that we were looking at during this COVID period was um, we were very lucky, I consider it lucky, Rhea will maybe consider it something else, but we got a donation for a considerable uh, amount of money for um, laptops that we were going to ensure weren't connected to the internet, but were able uh, to connect with John Howard societies. And we thought, okay, this is this would help with some uh, reintegration planning because we were hearing from CRFs that they were they were getting prisoners that they didn't know anything about, kind of being, um, you know pushed on them to some extent or, you know, um, and it, they didn't have a chance to do any um, any real individual planning or assessments before they were basically on their doorstep. Um, and we thought, okay, maybe we can, um, you know, hook up. In fact, we did. We tried it with uh, John Howard Society of Toronto with Scott. He was really willing to talk with a prisoner who was in Beaver Creek, which is, you know, it's... Uh, couple hundred miles, I would think, from Toronto um, about what their needs were and so on. And, and we had our John Howard person ready to take in this laptop and supervise the interaction so that the individual prisoner could talk to the John Howards at um, Toronto about what their needs were and how, to, how they could be met. And we were told, oh, look, uh, COVID is getting better. We don't need this anymore. So they, they kind of shut us down. But we thought, okay, if we could get those, if we could get some virtual communication capacity uh, between prisoners and receiving John Howard's ongoing, because I think this would be really good for remote 
communities. I mean, if somebody wanted to return to Brandon, and I don't know how far Stony Mountain is from Brandon, but I suspect it's a good distance. Um, but if they were, even if they were housed in, which often happens in, in an Ontario institution or an Atlantic institution, um, it would be good to have a capacity to be able to, uh, to meet and start that reintegration planning while the person is still on the inside. So I, I don't know what people think about the, this virtual uh, communication and whether that would be helpful, uh, particularly for some of the John Howards that aren't proximate to a federal institution and would have difficulty actually visiting someone there. I think that would be helpful. Um, I actually know that Red Deer managed to, or the Red Deer John Hart Society managed to get a, a laptop that was specially designed and it's in their re, the Red Deer Remand Center and so they can do intakes uh, online uh, with some of them and I know that that's been really successful for them and, and stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, the reality of how to get that in there is is a challenge, but uh, tricky. tricky. If we could, I, I absolutely think there'd be huge benefits to that. Yeah, I do too. As long as it didn't replace the face to face, because I think there's some good bonding that takes place when you're actually talking. Yeah, and something. I agree. Face to face is definitely way better. But but I know in in terms of working with, um, especially some of our higher risk um, people coming out, if we can have even those, we had one woman from Fraser Valley who who's been in prison her entire life and yeah and is. before she came out we were doing phone conversations with her on a weekly basis to try and nice. build that relationship and she's I mean she's had she's had some ups and downs in her time in the community but she's been with us off and on for a year and a half and she'd never lasted longer than a week and a half with us so that that relationship building is huge before they come out yeah. Uh, and I mean, we certainly see that with our, we have a new gang exit program too, that's with the, the provincial correctional centers and, and same thing, we're finding that we're losing them as soon as they get out to the community because we don't have enough time to build that relationship inside. So, so I agree the face to face is definitely the first and foremost, but, but any of that, those pieces that can help with relationship building is huge, huge. I also think it is an our it is the relationship with the John Howard staffers that make a difference, right? Because these are people who, you know, they see them as kind of on their side, like trying to coach and help and support their interests, which I don't think they get that with the correctional officials, particularly it's, it's more of a, you know, a gotcha kind of attitude that a lot of those parole officers have uh, and not particularly helpful. I, I don't know what people think about that. I agree with that 100%. Um, yeah. We just, yeah. we have a different name for ourselves. We're not representing the system. You know, most of these individuals have been traumatized by the system over and over and over again. And so to, to build trust with anybody who, who works in the system is, can be really hard. And that's not to say that it doesn't happen because I think that it does at times and, and things like that. But, but yeah, just that having the John Howard behind our name is, we find that too. Uh, you know, and we do literacy programs up at the Remount Center and, and yeah, it's great. some other things. And we, we, so we have a different, we're, we're viewed in a different way for sure. For sure we are. So what, what are the things that kind of screw people up as they're trying to make it back into the community? Is it addictions? Is it associations? Is it bad relationships? Is it poverty or loneliness? I mean, there's a lot of, they face a lot of stuff, but what are the ones that really are uh, that lead to further crime? Um, you fighting in, sorry. Go sorry, ahead, Chris. Chris. <laughs> um, from my experience, uh, Catherine, I think it's it's all of the above. Um, from my interaction, you know, that I've had over the years, from youth offenders, you know, uh, returning to the community. Um, and or adults and uh, you know we've got a, a, a few of um, frequent flyers I guess I don't know what that term still used today um, that we've seen come back and forth since the time they were teenagers right into their adult years yeah. and yeah. Um, with with those folks it's all of the above that you that you mentioned that uh, were barriers for those individuals so um, 
and you know, and I, and I, I think it's quite common for a lot of people. And if they don't have those, you know, built-in supports before they're released, and if they haven't established relationships into the, you know, with people in the community that they're returning to, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a, a setup for failure. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, are there enough resources in the community to sort of address some of these needs? Like um, I'm thinking substance abuse um, counseling or treatment, things like that. I mean, is the, are the resources, uh, is it a question of linking the person to the available resources or are there gaps in the resources that are available to meet the needs of the, of the people coming out? Yeah. Um, there, there's definitely gaps, and uh, I find with the, the John Howard Society staff, you know, locally, like in Nova Scotia, you know, we do what we can and get creative to try to fill those gaps. Uh, but is it enough to meet the uh, individual's needs? And then once they um, return to the community that they're going, are those resources um, available. Like we work quite closely with one of our um, halfway houses here that's in Truro as well, the Dismiss Society. And, um, you know, we've, we've established relationships with some of the individuals that want to connect with us. Um, but, you know, when, when they leave uh, the area, you know, I'm, I'm, we lose contact with them and I don't know whether they have those supports or not. We hope that they would. But, you know, it's, it's basically meeting the people's needs as, as they are today. Right. So what yeah. is it that they need yeah. today? Tomorrow, their need may be something different. Um, today, they may need a resume and uh, clothing to be able to start the first day in the job. Uh, next week, it could be assistance finding an apartment. So like what we try to do is to meet them on their needs, what their needs are at the very moment. And because we have little little funds as well, like there's only so much that, you know, an yeah. agency can, yeah. can yeah. support that. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. It's, um, I've certainly spoken to um, the John Howard Society of Kingston, who is, you know, located uh, within range of about, what, six federal prisons, and they have one reintegration worker. Uh, they don't necessarily get great access into the prisons. They do reintegrate group reintegration workshops, which is something but they don't have the capacity to do individual reintegration planning in the way that they would like. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think, I think the beauty of John Howard is that it does know the community resources that are available in its community and are pretty good at connecting people in need with what is available. But, you know, often like we find that um, perhaps mental health um, issues are not well served in the community or worse in prison, but um, there's just there's just not enough capacity to deal with a lot of the fairly significant mental health concerns that people have. I mean, they do come out traumatized. They do come out often with, um, you know, PTSD, which is something that's exacerbated by the prison experience. So it's it's tricky. It's tricky to find the all of the resources that they need, but none better than the John Howard workers who know what's available in their community, which is great which is great. Um, just to let you know, uh, there's sort of two areas that the national office is kind of working on. Um, one is the, the, the housing shortage. And it, it, it's interesting because we have um, two prototypes looking at solution labs for the complex housing problem of people being released from prison into homelessness, which is not good. Uh, people don't do well if they end up in a shelter after they've been in prison. So we're trying to trying to find ways of, of dealing with uh, with that. Uh, so that's a big it's a big priority for us. And um, Ria could probably elaborate on this, but we have she, she has applied for some funding. We find the employment uh, tricky, uh, and some of them, you know, there's a lot of employers that will take people with criminal records. Um, and there's a lot of um, prejudice against people with, with um, criminal records in terms of employment. So one of the areas we thought maybe could be enhanced is the idea of um, people going into their own little business, whether it's lawn care or whatever it happens to be. So we've looked to see whether or not there might be some interest in um, promoting entrepreneurial skills 
uh, for prisoners so that they might be ready to um, and able to start their own little business just because there's just not a lot of people who and there's too many of them that don't get hired by uh, employers and this might give them something to try so we're, we're sort of interested in, in that um, as well I don't know what people think about about that um, my view is that there's a whole range of skill sets among the prisoners that I've dealt with I mean some are, are highly intelligent well educated um, you know, able to do significant things, but are going to face roadblocks because of their background. And there are others who have, um, what would I describe it as, uh, psychological problems, taking instructions from employers or working collaboratively in a, in a working environment. They're just not, they're, I don't know, they're edgy or they have ADHD or there's, there's something where they would be all right working at their own speed, not taking direction from others, but managing their own their own work. And then the vast majority of them are quite capable of, you know, getting, um, getting skill sets which allow them to be employed uh, in usual ways. But it's not, not having money can often drive people back into either um, substance use or criminality, um, which is, I think, a bit of a problem, too. I don't know what people think about the employment um, issues, um, but these are challenging. Rhea, do you want to comment at all on the project? <clears throat> sure, Catherine. I'll just... That an organizer. here. Okay, so I, I did put together a proposal um, just before Christmas to uh, look at, um, as Catherine said, some some thoughts around and some ideas around how to um, promote self-employment for people uh, coming out of um, or while they're in the institution and then again um, connecting with them outside. It's kind of a through the prison gates kind of model where we can start with some social enterprise type activities and uh, business planning activities uh, while they're still inside and then uh, move into more of a coaching kind of phase um, on the outside. Um, there's definitely some significant advantages in my mind about uh, self-employment. Uh, I think there's also some significant drawbacks. It's, it's pretty difficult to make a really good go of, um, of a business. But the nice thing is if you're only supporting yourself and, and not needing to worry about employing other people, at least in the, on the front end, then um, you, know, you don't have to necessarily have uh, the same level of business as like a larger uh, business that has um, more people. And I think one of the other challenges that may be significant for some of our clients, um, they may have the idea, they might even have some ideas about how to roll that out. But when it comes to the administrative side, so things like bookkeeping, um, filing your taxes, uh, making sure that you're following employment legislation, those kinds of things that might pose some, some additional challenges. And so the idea of this particular project is that there would be access to uh, a person who can help coach you through that, uh, either by teaching you to do it for yourself or by taking on some of that role, um, helping you to do things like get insurance. So I, I think it could really make uh, a business startup a little simpler and a, with a lot more support um, for for some of our clients, and I, I think that's kind of a neat idea. Um, thanks, Ria. The other the other thing that we're kind of keen on with this uh, framework to reduce recidivism is something that we've seen in that works very very well in Norway, um, which is um, I'm going to just I'm gonna put the label on it as community-based recidivism reduction plans, which basically are organizations like the John Howard Society taking a lead role in assessing what the individual's needs are while they're pretty soon after being incarcerated, um, working with them to try and make sure that they get the program support while they're in custody that they need, 
working with um, them to build relationships, which um, Lacey and others have indicated it in, is so important while they're in, in prison in preparation for them coming out. And then putting that plan together, um, linking them to the potential community resources that they'll need on the outside. Um, and um, essentially having that as equivalent uh, in stature to the, um, uh, the correctional plans that uh, CSC puts together um, when you go before something like a parole board, that the parole board would take seriously um, this, uh, this level of support and this level of preparation in terms of managing your risk in the community. So we're very keen to see this this model that works so well in Norway. And, and one of the things that's interesting is that for just about all services in the Norwegian um, prison system, they contract out for it. So they're not, they're not relying on their own staff to provide this kind of service. Uh, and I think that might account for them having, you know, the lowest um, recidivism rates of anywhere in the world. Um, I think it needs, I think it really does need a human touch and I, I think people need to feel that they have some people on their side uh, who have some confidence in them and, and can, can help them. Uh, many of the people, I think, behind bars have, have uh, you know, experienced a lot of, of disappointment and hardship and frustration and trauma in their lives. And it's, they may not feel confident enough in and of themselves to be able to live successfully on the outside. And they need people to to coach them and support them and believe in them and, and give them the give them the human touch that they need. So I, I'm really excited about this bill C228 and what uh, what could be included in that and whether it could be used to kind of um, refocus um, community corrections and imprisonment as a lead up to community corrections and trying to make that seamless. The other thing I should mention that, that I think um, that Lacey mentioned, which I wasn't really aware of, the, the problems around uh, day parole and getting people, the, the conflict between uh, the federal and provincial governments, uh, federal government and provincial governments around uh, healthcare, around day, uh, day parole ease. Uh, one of the things that we're uh, quite adamant about in terms of our advocacy is uh, trying to get the responsibility for healthcare shifted away from Correctional Services of Canada altogether and placed into the provincial healthcare providers. I think this would help in terms of continuity of care. Again, uh, we're patient advocates for a few prisoners and one of them, for example, is from Barrie, Ontario. He had a, he's really sick. Uh, he's been a type one diabetic for years and then he's got all these complications and he's, he's really quite, um, quite vulnerable in the prison system. But he had this team of support who understood his health conditions pretty well. And they're just cut right off as soon as he gets a sentence of more than two years. And he goes into this, you know, substandard health care that's being provided by uh, Correctional Service of Canada. He's been in the intensive care unit several times because of the way they're managing his condition. Um, and it would generally, I think, be useful for reintegration purposes but the healthcare, there would be a continuity of care between the time they're in custody and are uh, going back into the community. And that would be both, you know, physical and, and mental health issues. Um, so that's one that we would really need, think could ultimately help with, um, uh, with reducing recidivism as well, or at least easing the, easing the reintegration. Catherine, I think Richard has his hand up. Richard, sorry. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, hello. I, I just wanted to make a quick comment regarding a point raised regarding um, uh, prisoners setting up their businesses and the, yes. the route to self-employment. Um, I mean, I understand the attractiveness of, of this from, from the perspectives that you shared and Ria shared as well. I just thought I'd for a couple of thoughts. I, I had a small business uh, and I it was focused on hiring barriers youth predominantly and I did I'm in Toronto and I, I did hire some clients from John Howard Society of Toronto yes. um, but as a small business as an ex small business owner I mean it, as, as it was as Ria mentioned it, it's kind of a tough gig um, so my, my only comment would be I given that John Howard has got is 
well known, has a strong brand. Um, for those of you doing research into possible paths forward with this, consider reaching out to other well known organizations that focus on helping uh, individuals to set up their businesses and offering a lot of mentoring. And I'm thinking specifically of something like Futurepreneur, which has a national presence. Um, I think they've got about 80 full time staff scattered across the country. And that sets up people. Um, and I'm not sure if they have any outreach initiatives underway with John Howard. I, I, I really don't know. But I do know people at Futurepreneur, if, if, if anyone needs any connections. Um, and they've set up prospective entrepreneurs with loans and more importantly, frankly, for the demographic we're uh, trying to help, uh, mentors. That's uh, great. And, and mentors in terms of putting together business plans to avoid, uh, obviously, things falling flat and people thinking of themselves as having failed yet again. So yeah. uh, I think that there's, there's going to be a lot of, pe there could be a lot of piecemeal efforts uh, uh, embarked upon through different uh, uh, parts of the John Howard network, but it might be a value. Uh, and again, touching on some of the points you mentioned, Catherine, about working in tandem with other existing organizations in different fields, to use a kind of a well-oiled network like the Futurepreneur one um, to help individuals who might be interested in, in starting their own businesses, uh, big or, you know, either sole, sole enterprises or, or in employing, you know, working in tandem with one or two others only um, when they when they come out of incarceration. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, so Rhea, you took that down. I wrote it down as well, but we should we should look into that. Um, I sure did. Richard, can I just verify you? You are connected with John Howard Society of Toronto. Uh, that's correct, Rhea. Yes, I. Okay. I I've, I have recruited in the past from, from them, but at the moment I'm in the midst of hopefully joining their board of directors and as part of that process found out about today's event. Okay, amazing, thank you. I think there are a lot of excellent things that could be done, um, but I, I take the point that I'm hearing that our capacity to devote as much to reintegration as we could uh, that would make it a difference uh, particularly around inreach and early uh, early connection with prisoners is limited. And we really need to work at um, trying to find resources so that our capacity in that area can be enhanced. Um, I agree with that. Like, I, I think that that, I mean, my heart goes out to uh, to the one intake, one intake worker at, uh, at Calgary, because I imagine he or she is swamped. Um, and it is, I think Kingston only has one person as well. And they're, it's just not adequate to deal with the level of need. And, you know, it's a, it's a core mandate of John Howard um, to support reintegration and, and the extent that we can get into those prisons and, and really um, work at that would be, would be, I think, very beneficial. So Rhea, can you find us some money for that? I'm just <laughs> sorry. Rhea is also our financial manager. I just uh, wanted to add. I'll get right on it. <laughs> and lots of it, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would be. I think that would be. That would be extremely helpful. Um, what about in some of the smaller communities? Are, are there unique problems in some of the some of the smaller communities? I shouldn't necessarily make an assumption that Sault Ste. Marie is small or that Brandon is small, but um, I'd be curious to know what the experiences there are like. Um, as far as Brandon goes, I think for, you know, typically the issues that you're speaking about are pretty similar here. Um, we're really limited as far as housing options and things like that. So that creates um, quite a problem when we're looking at reintegration. Um, we are quite lucky, though, based on our size that um, we do have a, I mean, we're dealing with a provincial facility mostly, but we do have a really good inreach program there where um, our staff are able to come in and meet with um, inmates. Obviously, that's been that's great. somewhat limited during COVID, although we have been able to maintain um, 
you know, off, off and on kind of throughout COVID, we have still been able to get in or to provide um, service through phone. And definitely over the last um, year and a half or two years, we, we've opened our men's resource center as part of our John Howard Society here. And we've really been able to build some good connections um, and Great. have people yeah. come. Um, and one of the other things that we've also been able to do is run kind of a, we call it ready for release program in the correctional center. So that gets us kind of in front of people and they see our faces and um, then they're able to reach out to us and we can get that sort of thing going. So um, yeah, that's been been really positive and, uh, and you know, because of the size of our community, it, it's kind of probably easier than in a lot of other places. Yeah, you can make the connections more easily, perhaps. Yeah, I, I do agree with you, though, that that idea of, um, you know, letting prisoners know that, that these, you know, these services are available is, is important as well. Um, John Howard Kingston used to run in the Ontario region uh, pre-release fairs where there would be representatives from all of the, like the Salvation Army and the uh, St. Leonard Societies and a lot of people who provide support uh, for prisoners when they're coming out uh, would have little booths like a science fair and prisoners would come into the gym and just sort of walk around and get a sense of who might be offering something in the community that they would like to return to. Um, yeah, is, and, sorry, yeah. that is something that happens regularly in the uh, Manitoba provincial facilities. That's great, that's great, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's excellent. Well, this is a, this has been extremely uh, extremely useful um, for me to get some ideas about what we should be pushing for in that um, framework. Uh, the framework is supposed to be accompanied by uh, some funding for pilot projects. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, enough pilots. I mean, we know we sort of have a good idea of what works. Why don't we just implement those on an ongoing basis?" Um, which I have a lot of sympathy for, but um, there may well be some opportunities to try some stuff out. Uh, so if people have ideas about um, pilots uh, that are worth testing, um, that would be that would be extremely useful as well. Um, I think we're very keen uh, to try and, and uh, make the um, framework to reduce um, recidivism more than a paper exercise and to actually see the government being held accountable for what it's doing on that front. Um, the Bill C-228 um, does require the federal government to uh, report to Parliament every three years on the progress that it's making to reduce recidivism. So I'm hoping that that will, you know, really, really put some pressure and revitalize um, community community efforts and community corrections because too much of too much of the federal effort is on the on the correctional side per se. Yeah, Ria. Um, Ben's got his hand up. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad you're pointing that out. I can't, I can't really see. They're not yellow, are they? They're a little. Go ahead, Ben. No. Sorry. No. Well, I, I want to say, and uh, you know, I, I want to mention to people that I'm a person who's actually spent some time in a federal institution, and uh, watch this from the inside, um, and of the, um, of the, mostly in a minimum security where you would think there would be a lot of attention to release, but in fact there was very little. Um, the system, as most of you will know, the system is basically uninterested in helping people to readjust or get ready to readjust. And indeed, one of the primary functions of parole officers, as I experienced it, was to tell people that they weren't ready to be paroled and needed to stay in yeah. prison longer. So, you know, when the parole board reports that prisoners are, uh, are waiving their paroles, what is really happening is parole officers are telling prisoners to waive their paroles. Um, but I do think in most prisons, you know, that it's so different from place to place. And so one of the things from for outside access is who are the potential allies in any given institution? You know, in one place, it might be a chaplain and in another place, it might be an assistant warden and in another place, it might be a programs officer. And to you can learn that from prisoners. They will know this. And that gives you a chance to uh, to get a sense of who you might use 
to get in because all of us know how hard it is to get into those institutions and uh, how effective they are at keeping you out when they want to do that. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Ben. And maybe we should be arguing that um, that part of that reintegration uh, planning uh, should 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 hold the correctional authorities, um, you know, accountable for uh, promoting community members to go in. I mean, they make it really difficult to get security clearances for people too. It just takes too long, you know. There was a comment that was posted in the chat window that I think is worth just sharing in case anyone missed it. It's from Narda. Uh, she says that in Alberta youth facilities, there are transition coordinators that are paid by the province. Um, nice. They serve as her main point of contact. Uh, they coordinate case meetings and work together to plan for their client's transition. However, she does indicate that the downfall is they're often reassigned to other duties. Yeah, that's interesting. I take, yeah, I mean, I, I think we do need to find the people who are most likely to facilitate access in the prisons. Um, and, you know, I think we really, re really need to revitalize our intake capacity and our programming in the prisons um, to the extent that we can. Um, there used to be a lot of volunteers. Uh, John Howard Canada at one point had a lot of volunteers that would go into the prisons and talk to prisoners and, you know, try and assess what their needs are and whatnot, but it's sort of fallen by the boards. Um, these things are vital. I, I, when you talk to prisoners, one of the things they really like are people from the outside coming in. This, they don't care what it is, if it's for basketball or, you know, a knitting class or whatever it happens to be. They like the, um, they like the community coming in. Uh, and I think that's a breath of fresh air, but I think we need to find more, more and more constructive ways of, of getting in there at an early stage to, to build relations with the people, particularly those that are high risk to reoffend, your frequent flyers and your, uh, you know, your guys who are going to be coming out at, uh, at stat release or at um, warrant expiry. They, they really need, you know, I, I don't know. To me, it's an abdication not to be really focusing on your on your warrant expiry guys. I mean, you think you're, you're claiming they're too too dangerous to be released on a conditional supervised release and then you release them with nothing. It's just crazy. It's crazy. This is great. Okay, are there any, does anybody have any last comments about uh, about what they would hope to see in this uh, framework to reduce recidivism? Um, the one thing that popped into my head that we haven't touched on is peer support models. Peer support, beautiful, yeah. So we're part of the justice sector constellation here in Calgary and, and they kind of have a post-release issues um, subgroup who has some students who are doing some research for us uh, in the area of peer support programs uh, and whatnot. Where we go with it from there, I don't know, but uh, I would be happy to share that research once it's, once it's done by the students. Super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we worked on a, um, a pilot project with uh, the uh, CORE Collaborative Centre for Health and uh, Public Education out of BC that involved uh, peer counselors for um, lifers who were getting out of prison. Mm -hmm. And Lifeline has had a lot of success as well. And they, they were invaluable. I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask Rhea to flip people the little video of this of this uh, project. This is really quite, quite something. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Peer support is not to be underestimated. A lot of credibility for people who've walked that path successfully and are turning around to help others. Yeah, it's great. Good. Well, this has been super. I, I really want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us and share their ideas and their experience. And uh, hopefully um, things will improve in the whole area of uh, recidivism reduction, reintegration planning and reintegration support. Um, and I look forward to working with maybe when we have our next staff conference, which have been put on hold because of COVID for the last two years, uh, we should we should focus on some inreach um, efforts and see if we can't learn from each other because I've certainly learned a lot today and I'm sure that there's much more that we could we could learn from each other. But thank you very very much and I wish you all the best. Happy John Howard Society Week. Have a drink. Enjoy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>